Minerals, energy and agriculture, now more than ever, are vital to Australia's clean energy future, economic growth and prosperity. Since 2016, Geoscience Australia has applied science and technology in new ways through the Exploring for the Future program. By gathering, analysing and interpreting data at unprecedented scale and detail, we're building a national picture of Australia's geology and resource potential. So how do we know where to look for potential minerals, energy and groundwater buried deep underground? By analysing rock samples and water percolating up from below, measuring signals from earthquakes and lightning strikes, surveying and mapping with aircraft and seismic trucks. We are looking, listening, monitoring and recording what the Earth is telling us. We look across the country and image hundreds of metres below the surface to create a picture of what lies below our feet, resulting in a new generation of maps and data. Each set of data we acquire is valuable in itself, but when we overlay the data sets together in a way no one has done before, we start to see the full picture and gain a greater understanding of where we can make new discoveries. Australia has become a world leader in the science and innovation behind resource exploration. We're placing data directly into the hands of the people who need it. Governments and local decision makers, investors, explorers and regional communities, supporting informed decisions that make a real difference to all Australians. We thank the people and communities who collaborate with us to ensure the success of our program. Together, our work is supporting the transition to a sustainable, clean energy future, building tomorrow's industries and stimulating regional economies to ensure the prosperity of future generations. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first session of day three of the 2024 Exploring for the Future Showcase. My name is Christina Anastasi, and I am the head of Geoscience Australia's Advice, Investment Attraction and Analysis Branch. I actually have the pleasure of moderating this session on hydrogen opportunities across Australia. Now, before we commence, I would like to begin with an acknowledgement of country video. Geoscience Australia acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledges their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to the people, the cultures and elders, past and present. At Geoscience Australia, we acknowledge that our mission to be the trusted source of Earth Sciences information is preceded by tens of thousands of years of knowledge gained by generations of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of that wisdom and of the lands, waters and skies where we work, live and learn. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are Australia's original mappers, miners and navigators. This is the heart of our work. And we have so much to learn from their many thousands of years of related knowledge. Now, I also want to personally recognise the First Nations people and traditional custodians of the lands we have accessed through this program. And I extend a warm welcome to all First Nations Australians who are joining us today and pay my respects to First Nations people and their elders past and present. Yesterday, we heard through the Exploring for the Future program National Data Collection and we heard how through the Exploring for the Future program, the National Data Collection and Interpretation has improved our understanding of the geology of the Australian continent with an emphasis on minerals. Now, we also heard about mapping specific geophysical and geochemical properties and geological units from the base of the Australian tectonic plate to the surface. Now, if you missed the session or would like to access the outputs we are releasing, there are links on the showcases webpage. Now, the work we are showcasing was only made possible through extensive collaboration 
and we sincerely want to thank all our collaborators for their valuable contributions. Today, the spotlight is on national assessments of specific commodities and related considerations of economic, environmental, social and governance factors. Now, many of these assessments build on the national data collection and interpretations that were outlined yesterday. This morning, we will focus on specific hydrogen related opportunities and emerging and promising industry sector for the Australian economy. There will be a question and answer session following the presentations where you can ask your own questions by using the Q&A stream at the top of your screen. The speakers are presenting on behalf of a large team, including many scientists, administrators and other professionals. Now, if they cannot answer your question, they will be happy to take it on notice via our email, which is eftf at ga.gov.au. Now, our first speaker is Dr. Eric Tenthery, who will talk about hydrogen storage opportunities and the role of depleted gas fields. Now, Eric is a senior researcher here at Geoscience Australia with expertise in geomechanics, carbon capture and storage, hydrogen and other low carbon geoscience disciplines. He holds a PhD from Columbia University and has worked as a researcher at the Australian National University. Now over to you, Eric. Hello, everybody. Today I'm going to give you an overview of hydrogen storage with an emphasis on storage in depleted gas fields, which is a relatively new and untested method of storing hydrogen. In this session, you're going to hear quite a bit about hydrogen and how it can contribute to a cleaner future for the world. So I thought I would start off by setting the scene and give you a bit of background to the hydrogen story. The reason people are talking so much about hydrogen around the world and also here at home is because when it's produced the right way, you can use it as a fuel and there are no CO2 emissions. It's therefore no surprise that the Australian government is making a big investment in hydrogen research and development in Australia to help meet their emissions targets. Currently, according to the Department of Climate Change, Energy, Environment and Water, we have over $200 billion in the pipeline for announced hydrogen investment in Australia and the government itself is putting in $500 million to support the development of hydrogen hubs in regional areas. Finally, the government will soon be releasing a revised national hydrogen strategy to make sure it's current and staying on the right path to become a hydrogen leader. In the first instance, hydrogen is likely not going to be used in all sectors in Australia. Its use will be targeted to areas where you can't easily use renewables or battery technology. For example, we're talking about heavy transport. In the top left, you can see an actual hydrogen powered truck, which apparently has a range of 1,900 kilometers, which is much better than what you could do with a battery. Exporting of hydrogen will likely be a big one. Uh, we can liquefy hydrogen or convert it into ammonia and then export to nearby Asian countries which don't have the resources to generate hydrogen. Another application that is gaining a lot of interest is green iron or steel. For example, instead of coal, we can use hydrogen in steel making, as you'll hear about in the next talk. We are the world's largest exporter of iron ore and studies show that there could be real cost benefits to converting the iron ore using hydrogen made in Australia. And then finally, there's the transformation of some of our key industries like fertilizers. Before I get into the various aspects of hydrogen storage, I just want to review the three key ways one can make hydrogen. There is also the potential for hydrogen from natural sources, which Chris Borum will talk to you about later, but I'm not discussing that here. Firstly, and probably most preferably from the climate point of view, is to use renewable energy to split water molecules and form oxygen and hydrogen as products. This is done using large electrolyzers powered by wind or solar energy. Currently, this method is rather expensive, but in the long term, electrolyzers are predicted to drop significantly in terms of cost. The other two methods involve fossil fuels, either coal or methane gas. If you react those fuels with water vapor at high temperatures, you can create hydrogen. However, these two mechanisms do involve the release of CO2 to varying degrees. If the hydrogen from these two reactions is to be clean, then you need to do something with the CO2. And the logical solution is carbon storage in the subsurface. And we have a team at Geoscience Australia who are addressing exactly those issues. 
Whatever method is chosen to produce hydrogen, the fact is you're going to need to store it somewhere before it can be used, transported, or exported. So how is hydrogen currently stored? You can store it in above ground containers, but these are very limited in volume and are generally used for specialist applications. For example, this is the largest uh, liquid hydrogen tank in the world, which holds about 200 tons of hydrogen. And as you can see on the right, one rocket launch consumes about 28 tons. So moderately sized surface tanks that are smaller than this are not going to be able to hold enough hydrogen to power a region. And powering a large industrial facility for any length of time would be challenging. The better option when wanting to store large volumes of hydrogen is to store it underground, either in caverns, which have been engineered in salt bodies, or in depleted gas fields, which have successfully trapped gas for millions of years. You can see two schematic illustrations that we've generated here on this slide. On the left, you can see this large salt diapir in white, which is pushed up through the sediments. And within that body, you can dissolve out an elongated void into which you can inject and store hydrogen. You may have seen Andrew Feitz's excellent talk on salt storage last year, uh, which outlined the great potential of salt in Australia. On the right is an illustration of storage into a depleted gas field. In this case, you don't need to engineer anything in the subsurface as you simply use the pore space in the reservoir rock to store the hydrogen and the domal structure will trap the hydrogen at the top of the structure. There are fundamental differences between these two storage solutions. When it comes to salt storage, this is a well-tested and used technology and is currently the preferred option for subsurface storage of hydrogen. You can see here on this table some of the more established salt storage operations and take a look at those storage capacities. In three of the four cases, we're looking at well over a thousand tons of hydrogen storage, uh, six or eight thousand tons in a few of the cases. Now remember the largest surface uh, storage option I showed previously only held 200 tons. So there's a big difference there. And look at the surface footprint of the Moss Bluff salt cavern on the left. It's very small. In addition to those established operations, there are more in the pipeline and they're much larger as well. Here are a couple of illustrations of planned salt storage projects, one in the Netherlands and the other in Utah in the United States. Here in Australia, we have lots of areas that are prospective for salt, and the low carbon team has done a great job in mapping those out. However, as you can see, a lot of these prospects are in remote areas, which may not be the first place one would want to produce hydrogen. Furthermore, there are a number of key metrics that need to be met for the salt to be used as a storage vessel. And you can see those on the right. Uh, minimal salt inclusions, at least 200 meters thick, optimal depths, uh, etc. Therefore, it would be ideal if another storage method was available. Uh, and that method is most likely to be depleted gas fields, which Australia has and will have more of in the future as the current gas fields deplete. At the moment, there's only one place in the world where they are storing hydrogen in a, a depleted gas field, and that's in the Rubensdorf field in Austria. The field is operated by RAG Aust Austria, who have a lot of experience with natural gas storage, but they're now moving into the hydrogen space. The operations at the Rubensdorf field started in April of 2023, and as, uh, as far as I know, there have not been any recent updates on the field's performance. The operation works as follows. They use renewable energy to power an electrolyzer, which produces hydrogen. The hydrogen is then compressed and injected into the depleted field, as shown in this schematic. Then when they need the energy, they withdraw the gas, condition it, and then use it in the gas grid or to fuel heavy transport or for direct utilization in industry. It will be interesting uh, to see how this operation is functioning and, and the challenges that they've encountered. Now that I've given you a bit of background on hydrogen storage, I want to talk about some recent EFTF modeling work that we've done on hydrogen storage in the hope of better understanding some of the key issues related to depleted field storage. In this study, we used the Naylor field at the Otway International Test Center as a template for reservoir and geomechanical modeling of hydrogen storage. The OITC is run by CO2CRC, and over the last 15 years or so, it's been used to run various CO2 storage experiments. More recently, they've endeavored to diversify and potentially look at things like hydrogen storage. The facility is located several hours drive uh, southwest from Melbourne, as you can see on the map there. In this work, we want to model the multi-cyclic injection of hydrogen into a depleted gas field, the Naylor field, and identify any flow-related or geomechanical risks that might exist. 
As part of the modeling, we conduct extensive sensitivity analyses to look at the effect of cushion gas, diffusion, methanogenesis, and temperature, along with a few other things. One of the key things we want to get out of this work is to see whether there are any key differences between hydrogen, methane, and CO2 injection uh, that we need to be aware of. We have lots of experience with CO2 and methane storage, but not with hydrogen. Just as a bit of background, this is what the nailer field looks like. Uh, it's a fault-bound anticline with ceiling faults on three sides of the structure, just over 2,000 meters below surface. The gas field was in production until 2003 and was used by CO2CRC from 2007 as a CO2 storage pilot project. The hydrogen injection and production that we're modeling in this study is conducted near the crest of the anticline, near the nailer one well. That's obviously the most logical place for the well because the buoyant gas will naturally migrate to the highest point in the structure. The models that were constructed in 2006 by CO2CRC and CSIRO were used as the foundation for the hydrogen modeling, and we were really lucky to have those as a starting point and thank them for making those available. The first step in this modeling process was to run some simulations comparing the original modeling with the modeling using our modified grid, which was designed for the geomechanical analysis. And it was here that we conducted some of the sensitivity analyses looking at cushion gas, diffusivity, dissolution, and methanogenesis. In this graph of pressure versus time, you can see the gas production phase early on, followed by pressure recovery. Then after that, we introduced the hydrogen. In these runs, we injected a reservoir volumetric rate of 1,500 meters cubed per day for injection and production. We had two injection production cycles, both for six months with one month shut in between each change. We also injected nitrogen as a cushion gas for 40 days at the beginning. I haven't talked about cushion gas yet, but whether you're doing salt storage or depleted field storage, you need to have a cushion gas in the reservoir, which never gets pulled out. The purpose of this gas is to make sure that the reservoir stays pressurized so that there is a natural drive toward the surface when you want to extract your hydrogen. You can see in this slide how cushion gas not only serves to maintain pressure in the reservoir, but it also has an effect on where the hydrogen migrates after being injected into the reservoir. In this study, we used nitrogen as a cushion gas due to its compressibility properties and also because it would eliminate any reactions between the injected hydrogen and carbon bearing species such as methane. The nitrogen serves to constrain the hydrogen to the top of the structure where you want it to be. In the left figure, there's no cushion gas and you can see the elevated hydrogen saturations migrate quite far down the structure. Whereas when you have the cushion gas in place, the hydrogen doesn't migrate down the flanks nearly as much. In the base case where you get hydrogen migrating down the flanks, that's a result of the buoyancy and low viscosity of the hydrogen. When there's no cushion gas, the hydrogen will stay up at the seal interface and run down the flank of the anticline. This slide compares how hydrogen behaves in the subsurface relative to methane, a gas we have lots of experience with in terms of storage. It should be emphasized that each run is done with the same reservoir volumetric conditions of 1500 meters cubed per day. Initially, nitrogen cushion gas, shown in green, is injected into the reservoir. In the top image, hydrogen, shown in red, is then injected into the reservoir, compressing and displacing the nitrogen to the lower parts of the reservoir. Mm. You can see that the behavior is very similar to what methane does when you inject it, and that's shown in the lower image. The cushion gas is behaving exactly as you want it to, staying separate from the working gas. In this next slide, we're looking at hydrogen and methane after the first production cycle. With hydrogen, you're getting mostly hydrogen back out of the system, and that's because it stayed at the crest of the anticline. You can also see how the nitrogen expands and fills back uh, most of the structure. Again, methane in the lower image behaves very much in the same way, with the cushion gas expanding upward. However, if you look at these two images carefully, you can see that there are cells with elevated hydrogen and methane after this first production cycle, indicating that there is some mixing between the working gas and the cushion gas. The model results tell us that only about 70 to 80% of the hydrogen is recovered with each cycle, which would require surface separation facilities and the replenishment of cushion gas. Alternatively, you could use hydrogen itself as a cushion gas and just accept that a certain percentage will stay in the reservoir and not be produced. One of the main points of the study is that the greatest geomechanical anomalies are driven by colder gases being introduced into a, a warm reservoir. 
and that's uh, and the different gas densities with depth lead to different thermal signatures for the for the different gases. In the case of hydrogen, there's less of a volume change between the surface and depth, which means that you need a smaller injection rate at the surface to get that 1500 meters cubed per day into the reservoir. And because the injection rate is slower, the gas has more time to equilibrate with the rock. So if you look at these three different thermal scenarios, you can see that hydrogen arrives at the reservoir at about 48 degrees, while CO2 arrives at about 28 degrees. For reference, the background reservoir temperature is about uh, 80 degrees Celsius. Now let's look at how these temperature differences down the wellbore translate into cooling in the vicinity of the wellbore in the reservoir. The top two panels here show the temperature decrease under uh, the hydrogen scenario after 10 cycles. In those cases, you're only getting about 25 degrees cooling, and the size of the anomaly is pretty well constrained. Compare that to the methane scenario in the bottom right, and you see that the temperature drop is about 35 degrees. Then if you look at the CO2 scenario in the bottom left, you see that the temperature drop is much larger, about 50 to 60 degrees. And the size of the thermal anomaly is much larger. It's also important to note that this thermal change doesn't only affect the reservoir, but also propagates into the cap rock, which as you will see, could have important implications for seal integrity. The issue with large thermal perturbations like this is that the contractive effect can lead to changes in the stress field and make fracturing easier. So ideally, the smaller the thermal perturbation, the better. And that's what hydrogen gives us relative to CO2 and methane. I want to wrap up this modeling study with a few key observations. As I showed you, the cushion gas plays an important role for hydrogen storage, not only for depleted gas storage, but for salt storage as well. Selecting the right cushion gas is critical, and this is still an area of research that people are working on. For salt storage, the cushion gas will be hydrogen, but it's not clear what will be the best cushion gas in a depleted gas field. We showed that thermally induced geomechanical uh, effects are smaller for hydrogen than for CO2 or methane under the same injection conditions. That's a good thing, which implies that if, if we can store methane gas successfully, then the geomechanics of hydrogen should also be fine. One table I didn't show in this presentation was the recovery of hydrogen after each storage cycle. We found that every cycle, only 70 to 80% of the hydrogen was recovered, and that there was some mixing between the hydrogen and the cushion gas. This is going to be something that needs uh, to be optimized in the future. Perhaps different injection configurations or ra rates of injection might help. The effects of diffusion and dissolution of hydrogen were also examined. I didn't show those results because incorporating these effects into the modeling really didn't have a meaningful effect. So when it comes to modeling hydrogen in these environments, it seems these effects can largely be ignored. Finally, there was uh, an analysis done regarding methanogenesis reactions. Uh, this is where um, the micro microbial interactions can lead to the conversion of hydrogen into methane. If this does happen on a large scale, then you can actually lose significant portions of your injected hydrogen. Based on the analysis done in this study, th there was insufficient time and contact with the carbon bearing species for these reactions to have been important in the conditions uh, we modeled. Just to finish up, I think based on the work that's been done, storage in depleted gas fields holds a lot of promise for the future. Based on previous studies, the modeling work presented here and also the pre-operations work in Austria, there don't seem to be any deal breakers for hydrogen storage in depleted fields. And here in Australia, we're well placed if depleted field storage comes into wide application. There are significant gas resources in Australia, and many of those resources have undergone significant uh, production, as you can see on this map. So that means there will be progressively more and more fields that can be used for this type of hydrogen storage. Before wrapping up, I just want to acknowledge the various people that have been involved with the hydrogen work at Geoscience Australia. My co-authors Andrew Feitz and the SLB team who were involved with the modeling work, and if you're interested in more detail, you, you can refer to the paper shown here. Then there's the entire low carbon geoscience and advice team who have done a great, uh, great work on various aspects of hydrogen research. They've also contributed a lot uh, to, the, to the figures I showed today. Finally, I wanna thank CO2, CRC and CSIRO for providing access to data and old models, uh, which has allowed us to perform the work that I showed you today. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you, Eric. Your discussion on the simulations of depleted gas fields as storage options for hydrogen provide a lot of insights into why these fields need to be considered, while also highlighting the importance of finding more suitable salt cavern storage to support the hydrogen sector. Now, our next speaker, Dr. Marcus Haynes, is going to present on the Green Steel Economic Fairways Mapper. Marcus is a geophysicist here at Geoscience Australia. He completed a PhD at ANU and leads the Economic Fairways project that was delivered under the Exploring for the Future program. In 2023, his team was awarded the Australian Museum's Eureka Prize for Innovative Research in Sustainability. Over to you, Marcus. If we want to understand the practical opportunities, for the development of a hydrogen industry in Australia, then we need to consider potential applications. The use of hydrogen for the decarbonisation of steel is an emergent area of interest across the globe. And here we present the Green Steel Economic Fairways Mapper, a new tool for delivering user-driven, high-level assessments of the economic viability for green hydrogen-based iron or steel production. And this is an important problem for Australia to think about. Australia exports for global steelmaking value chains in the 2022 to 23 financial year were valued at $193 billion. That's the value from the provision of steel feedstocks, like these majestic banded iron formations, and also from metallurgical coal. On the global stage, Australia doesn't make much steel. But our role within steelmaking value chains provides more than 41% of our combined commodity export earnings and contributes over 5.5% of our GDP. Steelmaking value chains are incredibly important for Australia's prosperity. However, steelmaking is an energy and carbon intensive industry. If we look at global greenhouse gas emissions, then the contribution from steelmaking is shown here in the yellow segment. That's over 7% of the total. According to the International Energy Agency, if the world is to hit the target of net zero by 2050, then the emissions intensity of steel needs to drop significantly in the short term. At the same time, forecasts suggest increasing demand for steel, particularly as development ramps up across Africa. So we're moving into a world that needs less emissions, but also more steel. The decarbonisation challenge is for novel, low carbon steel making technologies to be price competitive with traditional steel making. An analysis of global steel making production costs by Transition Zero reveals the longer term pre-COVID trends among the dominant steel making countries. There is some variability, but the five-year average cost of production equates to about 665 Australian dollars per tonne. And that sets the bar. But we're also seeing a movement towards more regulated markets, as indicated by the European Union's Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, or CBAM. An import tariff that seeks to prevent carbon leakage in international trade. Wood Mackenzie estimate that by the end of the CBAM phase-in period, which is about 2026, the cost for some key exporters to the European Union could exceed 275 US dollars per tonne for finished steel. That additional cost increases the benchmark to around 1,040 Australian dollars per tonne. Low carbon steel making technologies that can land within this range offer viable pathways towards green steel. And interest is focusing on the role of hydrogen in achieving this. Internationally, there is a growing list of developments being spun up to deploy hydrogen in steel making, not as an energy source in a conventional sense, but to do chemical work in the processing of iron oxides. H2 Green Steel's 5 megaton per annum uh, steel making project in Sweden is one example, with debt financing and takeoff contracts coming together 
with aims to have the project online by 2025. Similarly, construction has started on Vulcan's Green Steel's 5 megaton per annum facility in Oman, with that project aiming to come online in 2026. These examples are large scale and fully integrated, but there's also a host of announcements for other green iron and steel facilities, including within Australia. Changing to these new technologies, however, also comes with changes in process requirements. An important consideration here is that not all iron ores are the same. The annual Australia's Identified Mineral Resources Report, produced by our minerals advice team here at Geoscience Australia, shows the distribution of Australia's known iron ore resources. Broadly, they can be categorised into two main types. Hematite, shown here in red, and magnetite, shown here in black. There are some exceptions, but these resources were formed by the same general processes. Hematite, however, has seen subsequent upgrading through prolonged weathering. Iron oxides are fairly stable in the environment. So when these rocks weather, it's the gang, or the, the rubbish that we don't really want in the ores, like silica, aluminium, phosphorus. It's this that tends to get removed, to the extent that these hematite ores can more or less be directly dug up, shipped out, and used within traditional steelmaking. Because of this, about 97% of Australia's iron ore production is from these so-called direct shipping ores. In contrast, magnetite ores typically have lower concentrations of iron, at about 30%. But the iron in these ores is magnetic, and this can be exploited to upgrade uh, their, their concentrations. The concentrates that are produced from these magnetite ores are higher quality, both in terms of their iron content, but also in having lower concentrations of gang. The extra processing that's required uh, involves more energy, more money, so magnetite ores are more expensive to produce. Currently though, it is these higher quality concentrates that are needed within the green hydrogen-based steelmaking. So when we're thinking about the future and about a potential global transition from traditional steelmaking to hydrogen-based green steelmaking, what does that future look like for Australia? To answer this question, we need to focus on the key drivers about access to markets, access to ore, access to cheap energy, we need to think about how these drivers come together to define green steelmaking potential. To address these challenges, Geoscience Australia and Monash University have been collaborating on the Green Steel Economic Fairways Mapper. It represents a novel approach for the spatial techno-economic modelling of green iron and steel projects, and you can access it here at portal.ga.gov.au slash persona slash green steel. This is a screenshot of the landing page and you can see the regions in which the tool can be run outlined in red. We launched an initial beta version of this tool at a workshop with industry, academia and government in August last year. Since then, we've been incorporating the feedback and discussions from that event. Version 1.0 is available online right now. How does it work? Well, the challenge of looking at green steel is that the costs are masked due to the presence of multiple interconnected resource facilities. You can see in the middle of this diagram the electrolyzer providing hydrogen to the direct reduction shaft furnace and the electric arc furnace, part of the steel making route, before steel is cast, rolled and provided to consumers. All of this is supported by wind and solar renewables with battery and hydrogen storage tanks. We bring all of these components together within a self-consistent model. The model solves for the optimal sizing of the various system capacities uh, based on the site conditions. The solution is conditional on the assumed costs of each technology. We have our own opinions, 
but we also give freedom for users to vary these cost assumptions. The storage options, which are shown in purple, create operational flexibility. The battery provides uh, hours of electricity to balance varial supply on the order of days. Hydrogen tanks, on the other hand, provide storage on the order of months and can balance variability across seasons. Road or rail transport to the nearest port can be considered in two stages, as shown by the stars. First, after the shaft furnace to model the costs of producing green iron, or after casting and rolling to model the costs of producing green steel. When users open the tool, they're presented with a series of menus representing the major components of the iron and steel production system. The first of these is the steel plant. Users can choose whether to model the costs of producing hot briquetted iron or liquid steel. They can also model the uh, various system um, characteristics, including the capex or capital expenditure costs, which are the costs of deploying the various technologies. The second menu focuses on the hydrogen plant. At the moment, we only consider the use of proton exchange membrane or PEM electrolysis technology. Some users might be interested in the opportunities for natural hydrogen. That's something that we haven't included in the tool at this stage. Although I would like to foreshadow that uh, Chris Borum will be talking after me about natural hydrogen, including global trends and the Australian context. The third menu focuses on the energy systems involved in the production. Users can select to model wind, solar, or a hybrid mix of both. An important uh, part of our model is that we're focusing on islanded systems, that is systems that are self-contained and not connected to an existing electricity grid. Finally, users can input a number of economic assumptions, including uh, the price of iron ore going into the production facility. At the moment, we use a default value of 150 Australian dollars per tonne. This reflects the price that is paid for high quality magnetite ores uh, in port in China. So it already incorporates an aspect of transporting these high quality ores around. There's also the discount rate, which is the rate of return used to discount future cash flows back to their present value. So a user provides all of their assumptions and runs the tool, then what? Here is an example of using the tool to produce a national scale map to estimate the levelized costs of steel production. By levelized, we mean that we calculate the full project costs and average them per unit of production. This is the main visualization produced by the mapper and summarizes how the various system components come together to influence costs. This example is for a one megaton per annum production facility assuming our 2025 technology costings. This is a relatively modest production facility. If you look globally, uh, capacities gen generally range between 0.5 to 5 megaton per annum. We can see that within this model, relative low costs are distributed across most Australian states and territories. But beyond uh, levelized costs, we can also produce a breakdown of the various system components that have gone into generating that cost estimate. If we take a particular example, focusing on Port Hedland in Western Australia, we can see that for that estimate, it's assuming an installed system capacity of 979 megawatts of solar, 1,017 megawatts of wind, supported by 275 megawatts of battery storage and over 2,032 tonnes of hydrogen tank storage. It's a little bit difficult to put those numbers into some sort of context, but for a comparison, the generation on the West Australian electricity grid uh, over the last week uh, peaked at around 3,000 megawatts. So our relatively modest steelmaking facility equates to something on the order of uh, 30 to 40 percent of the existing West Australian electricity grid. The capacity of the mapper extends beyond simple cost estimates. And I want to give a few examples 
of how the tool can be used to generate insights. The first example is the use of the tool to get cost breakdowns and to undertake regional comparisons. Here we show not only the levelized costs, but also how these are broken down into individual system components, both for Port Hedland in Western Australia and for the Eyre Peninsula in South Australia. We also show the price points that I highlighted earlier. $665 for traditional steel production costs and $1,040 when incorporating the carbon border adjustment mechanism tariffs. We can see that uh, across both regions, while we have relatively similar overall levelized costs, it's when we look at the breakdowns that we begin to see the differences. The renewable energy characteristics in South Australia are a little bit more favorable, drawing down the overall energy costs. But the location that we've selected is a little bit more distant from the available transportation infrastructure, raising the transport costs. So we can see the individual differences and how that will influence the longer term pathway towards green steel across these two regions. As another example, I'd like to link back to the talk that we've just heard from Eric regarding hydrogen storage. Underground storage is much cheaper for large scale storage of hydrogen than, than other forms. Here, I'd like to focus on the potential impact of salt cavern storage. The mapper models the cost of hydrogen storage, assuming on-site storage in above ground hydrogen tanks. And this is a reasonable starting assumption because it's a technology which can be deployed anywhere. However, there is a growing interest in geological storage options for hydrogen storage in salt caverns. Internationally, salt caverns are already being used for industrial hydrogen storage with working capacities ranging from 1,000 to 8,000 ton. Salt cavern storage has been estimated to be up to 90% cheaper relative to above ground compressed gas tanks for longer term storage cycles. Australia has examples of thick salt structures which may be suitable for storage, though more fundamental research is required to confirm specific sites. For example, if we consider the Malawa Formation, part of the Canning Basin in Western Australia, we've observed thick, thick salts there, although the salts that we have observed tend to be interbedded with other materials and so are unlikely to form the required seal. But that doesn't preclude the presence of possible salt structures that we are yet to find. If we could find suitable salt structures in the Malawa Formation, then that could help reduce the overall levelized costs of steel production in the Pilbara by up to $138 per tonne. This would complement the technology cost reductions that I flagged earlier. To improve the competitiveness and viability of green steel production. Beyond opportunities for cost reduction though, this example highlights how pragmatic production scenarios can be used for regional prioritization of future research into Australian geological salt structures. As a final example, I'd like to talk about energy curtailment. You can think of curtailment as energy wastage, although more accurately, it looks like not running a wind turbine when it could be spinning. In this figure, we have a little peek under the hood of the Green Steel Economic Fairways Mapper. We see the hour by hour energy flows through the system over the course of a week. Renewable energy generation is shown in green. Consumption from the furnaces in orange is a relatively minor component, but constant. The hydrogen electrolyzer in teal is a big consumer of energy. And our curtailment is shown here in red. It tends to occur mainly in diurnal pulses when the solar capacity exceeds electrolysis capacity. Despite this model being well optimized with respect to reducing costs, energy curtailment remains a notable characteristic. The annual energy curtailment of projects can be extracted from the models and mapped. If we again take Port Hedland as an example, 
the annual energy curtailment is estimated to be 1.4 terawatt hours. If we could realize a net income of 3 cents to the kilowatt hour on curtailed energy, then this could further supplement estimated levelized costs by around $42 per tonne. Now this could occur through the direct supply of power to agile industries, or indirectly through additional hydrogen and ammonia production. This could be used, for instance, to decarbonize international shipping or exported to help our trading partners realize their hydrogen ambitions. The transmission infrastructure shown here highlights the proximity to established industries who could access cheap energy with additional transmission infrastructure. The government has announced that it will also establish the hydrogen production tax incentive to incentivize renewable hydrogen production. The incentive will provide a $2 incentive per kilogram of renewable hydrogen production for up to 10 years for projects that reach final investment decision by 2030. With green steel requiring 72 kilos of hydrogen per tonne, this equates to a, an additional $144 per tonne. Here, we've shown not only the cost estimates produced by the tool, but also how the tool can be used to drive insights. We've shown several options for reducing costs and enhancing Australia's competitiveness. And we've highlighted how these options point towards viable pathways in which green steel can be cost competitive with traditional steel. As we think about where we're going into the future, it's no doubt that the horizon is hazy and that there's a lot of uncertainty. But tools like the Green Steel Economic Fairways Mapper are valuable in being able to bring information forward to the earliest stages of decision making so that we can understand the broad contours of the challenge and make better informed decisions. This is an open capability for industry, academia, government and the general public. The mapper provides an initial framework from which to target more detailed follow-up studies. The tool highlights both the scale of the decarbonisation challenge and the opportunities for Australia. With our preferred costing assumptions, relative low-cost iron and steel production is modelled within most Australian states and territories. What's encouraging is that these models point to viable pathways in which Australian green steel can be made competitive relative to traditional steel. Importantly, however, the mapper helps us to identify actions that can contribute. Geoscience to identify viable underground salt storage targets. Actions to facilitate common infrastructure usage. These have real world impacts for Australia's competitiveness and we can begin to put numbers on what those impacts might be. The mapper takes the complexity of multiple systems and shows how they interact. It maps regional advantages and site-specific characteristics. It shows how geoscience can inform us on the practical opportunities for hydrogen development and shapes our understanding of what the most pertinent questions are in these spaces. If you'd like to know more about the outcomes of the Green Steel Economic Fairways Mapping Project, then we have a range of publications that you can go to, from the Hydrogen Economic Fairways Mapping Tool to the broader Green Steel context, details about our Green Steel model or the portal tool, as well as a case study looking at splitting the value chain with international trading partners. And I'd like to finish by acknowledging the significant contributions of our Monash University collaborators, and in particular, Dr. Stuart Walsh and Dr. Chang Long Wang. Thank you. Well, thank you, Marcus. Each time you speak on this topic, there is always added information. You provided a compelling assessment that seems to indicate that green steel manufacturing is feasible. These opportunities support the Australian government's future Made in Australia plan and highlight the importance of geospatial information in realising such outcomes. And now, for our final speaker for this morning, 
we are going to hear from Dr. Chris Borum on natural hydrogen, the Australian context. Chris is a principal geochemist here at Geoscience Australia and he obtained his PhD in chemistry at the ANU. Chris applies his skills to understanding the petroleum system, abiotic gas, hydrogen and helium in Australian basins. He was also a key researcher in field studies on underground carbon dioxide storage in Australia. Now over to you, Chris. Well, thanks for the introduction. My talk today is Natural Hydrogen, the Australian Context. I won't be covering what's been done everywhere in Australia, but just what we've done in the EFTF program. First, I would like to acknowledge my co-workers at Geoscience Australia and the Geological Survey New South Wales and Coal Innovation New South Wales, as well as the many external collaborators. As we reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and move towards a low carbon and net zero future, hydrogen will play an increasingly important role. So this cartoon shows the hydrogen ecosystem, mainly based around hydrogen as a fuel and renewable energy. Now today, hydrogen is manufactured, mainly through the steam reforming of natural gas and coal with the production of CO2. Now today, CO2 is vented to the atmosphere and this is termed grey hydrogen, if from natural gas. If the CO2 is captured and stored underground, that's blue hydrogen. But the holy grail is to use renewable energy to electrolyze water into hydrogen with little or no greenhouse effect. But there's also another source of hydrogen and that's natural hydrogen in the subsurface. And that's termed, well, natural hydrogen, but it does have other names. And today it's the most cost effective and continues probably to be so in the short to medium term. So what are the elements of a natural hydrogen system? Well, surprisingly not. They're similar to or the same as the petroleum system, coming from source up to preservation. Now, from a petroleum system point of view and focusing on the source, there's one dominant source, which is from thermal decomposition of organic matter. But for hydrogen, it also has an organic source, but it has many more sources which are inorganic, from mainly from fluid lot interaction. So from a petroleum system, we know a lot of information from since when it was first produced 150 years ago. Since then, about 135 billion barrels of oil has been uh, extracted, whereas for the hydrogen system, we've only got one producing oil and that's a small volume, like a drop in the ocean compared with petroleum. So for a petroleum system, we have sophisticated models, whereas for natural hydrogen, these models are only rudimentary. So here's a popular cartoon showing the elements of the natural hydrogen system. But in reality, for sources, there's only four that we should consider leading to some exploitable resources of natural hydrogen. One is the radiolysis of water, where the energy is from the ionization re released from potassium, thorium and uranium bearing minerals. The other, the other source is a reduction, uh, redox reaction involving the reduction of water and the oxidation of ferrous uh, ferric iron. That's like in the serpentization of ultramafic rock. There's a deep-seated source, termed the primordial hydric earth model, and that has various forms of hydrogen that are mainly concentrated in the lower mantle, upper core, which was inherited from when the earth was formed. And then finally, there's the late maturation of organic matter or the organic hydrogen source. So what are the other elements? Well, in this, again, popular diagram, we mainly have diffusion of hydrogen. But if we throw in a, a few uh, steep faulting, we can get evection. Now that's like the superhighway for hydrogen migration. And compared with the slow diffusion, since hydrogen is reactive, uh, many things can happen for hydrogen loss along the way. So what are the exploration tools we have available for uh, natural hydrogen? Well, we have surface imaging and also below surface imaging. 
So for example, let's just look at radiometrics. Geoscience Australia has a radiometric map of Australia. So we can model the generation of natural hydrogen. Now if we sum that over a depth from surface to one kilometre, it, it averages about 9 million cubic feet of uh, natural hydrogen per year. As I said before, the sources of natural hydrogen are mainly inorganic. So here we have the range of inorganic rock top types from felsic to ultramafic. Now the felsic rocks are rich in potassium, thorium and uranium, so they're predisposed for the radiolysis reaction. Whereas ultramafic rocks are rich in ferrous iron, so we can have, for example, serpentinization of ultramafic rocks. Thorium and uranium also radioactive decomposition to helium. And as well, these felsic rocks can be enriched in potassium and uh, ferrous iron. So from the ferrous iron point of view, we can have our redox reaction. So what's the evidence of natural hydrogen in the subsurface? Well, many of you have probably seen this uh, plot before where we show the occurrence of natural hydrogen in natural gases. And this is a compilation of data analysed in the GA laboratories and their predecessors over the last century. As you can see, the majority of gases, in this case around 80%, have low hydrogen contents. So that is less than 0.01%. But there's a handful that are hydrogen rich, greater than 10%. Now from an exploration point of view, this is quite exciting because there are examples in every state and territory. So what has we done since that publication and why? Well, the why is we're wanting to further identify and quantify hydrogen occurrences in the subsurface as well as their sources. And for this talk, I will show you what we've done in a series of case studies. The first involved is the organic hydro hydrogen generation. So we turn to a petroleum system model that we developed a few years ago for the Cooper Aramanga Basin. Now in this basin, in the top picture, to the southwest we have two main depot centres in purple, to the north the Patchawara Trough and to the south the Napameri Trough. Now the main source rock is the Permian Patchawara Formation Coals and these are shown in cross section as the thick light blue interval. So where on a maturity or temperature uh, continuum does petroleum and hydrogen occur. This is the generation from a source rock. So we see that they're quite separate. Hydrogen is mainly generated once you have generated all your oil and gas. So in over mature source rocks. So the generation of hydrogen and petroleum is just a chemical reaction and that's controlled by time and temperature. So if we know or model a burial history and maturation history model, we have time and temperature. So we need to determine the chemical kinetics of the, the source rock. So in petroleum, the chemical kinetics are dependent on the organic matter type, whereas for hydrogen, it's independent. So in certain aspects, modeling hydrogen generation from the source is a much more simpler process. So we modeled a mid Pachawara formation surface, and here we plot the transformation ratio for generation of hydrogen. As you can see, there is a sweet spot in the Napa Meri trough where the transformation ratio is up to about 0.6. So 60% of hydrogen that could be generated has been generated in the, the deepest part. So then we can look at the volume or thickness of the various source rocks. One's the carbonaceous shale and the other the coal, and then sum that up to get volumetrics. But before I show you that, it will just concentrate on the last two columns. We see that in the Cooper Basin, 50% of total methane that could be generated has been generated. And for hydrogen, it's only 5% has been generated of what could possibly be generated. But that 5% totals up to over a billion tonnes of organic hydrogen. Now this is about an order of magnitude more than what was manufactured in 2022. Billion tonnes sounds like a big number, but it's certainly not a humongous number. But 
in the Cooper Basin, we should be able to see some wells that have high hydrogen contents. So, how do we calibrate this model? Well, like I said, let's look at the wells. So we analyse well completion reports for over 3,000 wells, but only in 1% of the wells did we find any data on hydrogen percent. Now, this is most likely a reflection of the industry's focus on petroleum and where hydrogen was not uh, really analysed as part of the analytical procedure. So, in the wells that we, we detected a higher concentration of hydrogen, we see that, say, at Corkwood, we have 20, about 25% of hydrogen. And there's the wells with high hydrogen, greater than 1%, are distributed around the edge of the Napameri trough, which could be consistent with migration from the depot centre up to the, the, the margin of the basin. But those further to the, the west in the Pachawara trough, the migration pathway would be very torturous from an organic hydrogen point of view. So in the Cooper Basin, most likely there's multiple sources of hydrogen. The second case study is a radiolysis. Here we look into Northern Australia, where Geoscience Australia a few years ago did a seismic survey in the frontier region and um, discovered a new subbasin, the Karara subbasin in purple. They subsequently drilled a well, NDI Karara 1, uh, which intercepted Proterozoic or Paleoproterozoic uh, source rocks. But also during drilling, gas was bubbling in the return mud, and this was sampled and analysed back at Geoscience Australia. But let's just for, just for fun assume that the hydrogen was generated from an organic source. So we have a beryl and maturation history model of NDI Carrara 1, and a transformation ratio of one, everything's converted to petroleum, hydrogen generation should uh, be, be ongoing. So the petroleum generation stopped at about 1.2 billion years ago. So hydrogen uh, should be, ha would need to be preserved for over a billion years if we if still observe it. Some in the audience may think that that's just too long, but I draw your attention to the adjacent Bidaloo subbasin where shale gas in uh, large quantities are in protozoic rocks of similar age. So back to the analysis of the gases. During drilling, mud gas was analysed, and here we see a downhole profile of the methane in the blue circles. And for the gases analysed in the lab, we have hydrogen to methane ratio. As you can see, there's not really a good one-to-one -one correspondence, which may indicate we have different sources for methane and hydrogen. So let's do some modelling. We can model hydrogen and helium generation. Of course, we have measured potassium, thorium and uranium contents, as well as other measured and interpreted data. So a modelled radiogenic hydrogen to helium ratio was 120. Now, this was the same with the experimental that we saw in the, the possum belly gases. So in this case, radiogenic origin for hydrogen is most likely. So the last two examples, we're using a bottom-up approach, starting at the source, whereas here it's a top-down approach. So if we're at the top of the hydrogen system uh, elements in the preservation mode. So hydrogen has reached the surface or near surface. So we did soil gas surveys uh, close to Tumut with the uh, white dots, but the most were done in far west New South Wales. So the sampling locations were selected based on possible sources for natural hydrogen, being granites, ultramafics, banded iron formations, other mineralized zones, diatremes, etc. But let's just look at one of the tools we use was magnetics. Here we see a map of total magnetic intensity reduced to pole. The red is strong magnetic intensity, indicating uh, iron-rich rocks. And we'll focus further onto the ultramafics. And then case study three is looking at this serpentinization reaction. So note the scale here, you know, zero to 50 kilometers, up to 10 kilometers. Now we're honing in on, you know, just a couple of kilometers. And we see in this map to the right, our soil gas results. And there we have soil gases, which are reasonably high, greater than 300 ppm of hydrogen. Now these occur at the edge of the, the Kulak serpentinite. And here, this, this ophelite sequence 
is characterized by steep diffing faults and also interpreted extensional faults, which can provide the migration pathway of hydrogen to the surface. Now, this model is analogous to the hydrogen-rich gas seep in Turkey, the Chimera uh, eternal flame, which has been burning for over 2,000 years. And in this case, our source for hydrogen in the Kulak serpentinite region is the serpentinization reaction. So, where in Australia should we explore for natural hydrogen? We could look at the historical wells. These are the low-hanging fruit, but we also need to have the regulatory framework in place to allow exploration. And South Australia was the first state or territory to have such a, a framework. So here we'll focus down on the Ramsey oil bore, which had around 76% natural hydrogen. So it was drilled about 100 years ago, shallow well into lower Cambrian carbonates. The basement rocks were iron rich or potassium rich uh, granites. Now our model for hydrogen generation, we have infiltration of water, redox reaction, as well as uh, radiolysis of water. So we have a potential dual source here. So we actually don't have gases to analyze. So we look at the evidence of hydrogen in rocks in the subsurface. So one way to do that is to look at the gases inside, trapped inside fluid inclusions. Now to access those, we crush the rocks and measure the volatiles by mass spectrometry. Now there's a selection of wells that we've analyzed through this technique. And what we've found is that in all wells, we've seen elevated hydrogen contents but these are mostly at specific intervals. So for our last case study, we'll focus on the Stansbury West well. So this well was drilled just south of the historic Ramsey oil bore, and also it penetrated the upper Archean basement or the granite. So sampling was quite intense. And here we see on the left, the downhole profile of hydrogen and on the right, the downhole profile of helium. Now, we also see uh, specific intervals where we have elevated hydrogen and elevated helium. Well, gold hydrogen late last year drilled two new wells, Ramsey 1 and 2, very close to the historic Ramsey oil bore, and they indeed found specific intervals with high hydrogen and high helium, consistent with what we observed in uh, the, our Stansbury West well. So in summary, Geoscience Australia has undertaken multiple diverse studies over the past four years to document the occurrences and sources of natural hydrogen. We base that on existing data and the collection of new data sets. This data was collected in sedimentary and non-sedimentary sequences using a top-down and bottom-up approach. So we found hydrogen was quite common in the subsurface, probably more than we expected. Large volumes of natural hydrogen have been modelled in those source rocks that we consider the most perspective. Crustal sources of natural hydrogen dominate where relatively shallow, hydrogen-rich natural gases have been analysed. Guidelines for natural hydrogen exploration are source-specific. And what I've shown you, there are many sources of natural hydrogen, so they're yet to be fully developed. Industry exploration in the future should reveal whether there are exploitable resources of natural hydrogen in Australia. So please watch this place. Thank you, Chris. You always convey a wealth of knowledge. Over the last four years, your research into and expertise in the geochemistry of hydrocarbon systems, hydrogen and helium has significantly advanced the understanding of Australia's natural hydrogen resource potential. Now, this brings us to the best session of today, and this is our question and answer session. I would like to welcome our studio panel. Now, you might be wondering why they might be looking a bit different. Two of our presenters are here, ready to answer your questions. However, Eric is currently overseas, so Dr. Andrew Feitz has joined the panel, and he will answer the questions on Eric's behalf. Now, can I please remind you to add your questions in the Q&A panel on your screen and include the name of the presenter you'd like to ask. Now, to kick things off, I have an icebre icebreaker question for all the pre presenters. So, 
What are the top insights from your work over the past four years and what are the future opportunities we can build on? I might ask you, Andrew, to go first. Thanks, Christina. I think the last four years we've achieved amazing results. And the thing that strikes me, particularly in the hydrogen space, is our work on storage. So when the hydrogen strategy first came out, that was five years ago, underground storage didn't feature in it at all. But over these last four years, we've mapped where the salts are, we're looking at understanding the, whether you can store in a depleted gas field. And now we see from Marcus's talk just how important that is for a green steel. So, yeah, I think that's been a real highlight for me. That's great. Marcus, did you want to...? Yeah, I, I guess I reflect on um, where we've come from in the green steel project. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a lot of talk about, I guess, Australia's iron ore resources and our abundant renewable energy resources. Uh, there was a lot of hype around hydrogen. Um, through the Green Steel Economic Fairways Mapper project, um, we've been able to develop a capability that actually allows us to put some numbers on that, look at the dynamic of how these factors come together to influence um, the viability of this technology uh, in Australia. Um, I, I think you know, in terms of the major insights, uh, I've been somewhat surprised um, in undertaking this project just how important um, location can be for these sorts of problems. Uh, and the insights that this tool has allowed us to gain in terms of looking at which parts of the country come up as relatively prospective. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess that uh, it gives us a, a real capability to look at um, how we undertake our science. Um, I, I'm really excited in terms of the future opportunities around how this can inform, again, you know, where we think about the opportunities for um, salt storage, um, where we think about where we might undertake our pre-competitive geoscience to, to best... Uh, I guess, um, leverage these uh, opportunities and, and have an impact in terms of being able to live, deliver um, technologies like green steel. It's, it's a really exciting time. We're right at the forefront of everything, mm. new opportunities. Chris, especially in the areas you've been looking at. Uh, I suppose insights or highlights would be that when we first started around four years ago, natural hydrogen wasn't really on the radar of explorationists or... Um, or even on the fringe of uh, petroleum exploration. But within those four years, we've actually seen a, a first Australian well drilled specifically for natural hydrogen. Mm. So I think that's, um, that's certainly a, a highlight. And also, I think that the work that we've done with the FTF has uh, in, in some way uh, contributed to that, sort of uh, you know, taking that step in, in, in drilling a an exploration well and any testing is still going so we look forward to those results. I suppose what I presented in the presentation were snapshots of uh, short time frame studies mainly demonstrating the occurrence of natural hydrogen in different environments and rock types. So I think for the in the future in the RAP program we have the opportunity to delve more deeply using some of the amazing data sets that have been presented in the showcase, uh, layer geology, the AEM, the magnetics, um, TM, gravity. So I think a, a, pro, a, a program looking at developing our understanding of a hydrogen system is uh, much needed because at the moment our models for exploration for natural hydrogen are pretty rudimentary. What an exciting time, and, and you did already touch on, you know, we're looking forward into how this can all move in resourcing Australia's prosperity. Um, I might now move, to, we got some questions and coming through, and the first one is to you, Andrew, um, and it's from Anthony Palmieri, and the question is, if nitrogen is to be used as a cushion gas, can it be produced without CO2 emissions, much like green hydrogen? Okay, well, thanks, Anthony, for the question. Um, my understanding is the nitrogen would be produced using a sort of turnkey standard um, liquid separation, uh, sorry, air separation unit. So that basically you need a whole lot of electricity to go into those sort of plants um, with, with some water for cooling. 
Um, I am aware that there are pro uh, plants around the world which are trying to utilize renewable energy or a, a significant portion of renewable energy, so they're a bit more flexible. So in that case, they should you could probably move towards that way. Um, but yeah, they'd be hooked up to, they'd rely on the electricity that's available. Um, there would be a little bit of CO2, of course, because we're pulling a bit of CO2 out of the air, but that's a very small fraction of the, um, uh, of the nitrogen that would be produced. Well, thanks for that, Andrew. Yeah. Um, for Chris, this is from John Kuehl, and my apologies if I um, said the name wrong. Uh, Chris, thank you very much for your presentation. Now, are you seeing any commercial exploration of natural H2 in Australia? And what sort of cost per kilogram could we achieve with natural hydrogen versus other manufactured methods? Oh, thanks for the question. Yes, there definitely is commercial exploration for natural hydrogen in Australia, as I alluded to. Uh, there's been first well drilled at the end of last year uh, for natural hydrogen in South Australia. Now one of the main drivers for that and also a reason is that the, uh, the government regulatory environment was in place so South Australian government were one of the first, well were the first movers in that which allowed exploration. So with other states and the Northern Territory um, having their regulatory uh, exploration uh, environment in place and I would see that there'll be more sort of wells drilled specifically for natural hydrogen. Now for the cost, well that's uh, vary, varying depending on your hydrogen or exploration model. A lot of the wells to date that have been drilled, say there's commercial production in, in West Africa of a well, but they have been fairly shallow. And again, in the South Australian context, the well was drilled to about a kilometre. So those costs are very manageable and obviously they can be quite well constrained. So the cost of, if you're targeting those um, reservoirs or, or um, places to look for natural hydrogen, then natural hydrogen is very competitive with manufactured uh, methods it uh, could be around a, a dollar US per kilogram, whereas uh, if you're looking for a green hydrogen, that has a, a, a very high cost. So obviously today it's, it's very com price competitive to drill a natural hydrogen well. But then if you're looking for much deeper sources of natural hydrogen, then the, the cost will go up. But I would say in the, the short to medium term, natural hydrogen exploration will be uh, cost competitive with um, sort of um, our, our, our manufactured methods. And the, the, the main manufactured method is for the uh, converting methane into hydrogen. So that could be about two to three dollars per kilogram. Yeah, interesting insights, Chris. Um, Andrew, here's another one, and this one's from Mark Duffett. Um, has any consideration been given to using CO2 as a cushion gas? So the reservoir does double duty as both H2 and CO2 storage. All right. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, this is interesting because uh, in Eric's talk, he talked about a project in, uh, I think it was Austria, where they're looking at injecting hydrogen into a reservoir. Now, the longer term view for that project is actually to do exactly what you're saying, but it's not to store the CO2, it's to convert the CO2 into methane. So hydrogen is very reactive with CO2 and it'll convert into methane. So by um, sort of combining that, the, I think the objective is that they would inject CO2, inject hydrogen, have a sort of underground reactor to produce hydrogen, uh, so, sorry, produce methane, and then they extract the hydrogen and the methane out of the reservoir. So, yeah, um, that, so it depends if you're looking at storage or whether you're looking at also producing methane. Okay, thanks for that, Andrew. I might 
We, we've, these questions are coming thick and fast, so <laughs> we'll move into the next one. And this one's for you, Chris. Uh, Anthony Palmieri um, has asked, do you think there is potential to find natural hydrogen offshore? Well, um, definitely potential for natural mm. hydrogen offshore. Mm. Uh, obviously, uh, cost of drilling yeah. will, will be a, a factor there. So, again, it's... Um, can you produce it economically? Yeah. Uh, but the, the rock types that are onshore, uh, uh, offshore, uh, mainly obviously probably deeper than than onshore. But anyway, I think it's certainly a uh, an area worth exploring. Thanks for that, Chris. Uh, Marcus, we've got a question to, for you today from Sarah Buckerfield. Great talk. Um, thank you. Do you know if the Department of Climate Change, Energy, the Environment and Water are going to be using this to help inform their regional planning or if it was used to identify the renewable energy zones? Uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, I guess the, the short answer to that question is no, not at this stage. Um, the Green Steel Economic Fairways Mapper was something that we released in its current form um, relatively recently in, in mid-May this year. Um, so it's it's still early stages, um, but you know we've been talking to the broader government, uh, industry, and academia. We had a, a workshop um, as part of our development of this tool uh, in late uh, August last year. Um, so certainly been informed of the process. Um, I probably reflect that um, you know certainly based on our previous experience uh, with tools like the hydrogen economic fairways tool HEFT. Um, where we have seen um, that being used to inform decisions like the, the hydrogen hubs. Um, so I think it's, it, there's certainly options there, um, but still early days. That's right, Marcus. The, uh, the um, economic fairways tool has been used uh, in a number of areas and Green Steel is just new and one we're working towards and a great example of the hydrogen one. Um, and talking, um, moving forward, another one now for Andrew from... Uh, Anitha Gandhi, uh, is hydrogen leakage uh, being considered? If so, is there an estimate of the leakage rate? All right. Uh, with this one, it depends on what you call leakage. So are we talking about leakage towards the surface where the well is drilled? Um, in that case, the leakage would be you know, basically non-existent. You want to make sure that the, that does not happen. Um, there's the potential that the hydrogen might be um, uh, moving to the cap rock and not be able to be extracted. So that would be an another sort of form of leakage. And that's sort of estimated to be in the order of about 1%. I've seen some studies. But I guess really the issue is whether, you, whether it's leakage or losses, because we saw from Eric's talk that you can put the hydrogen into a depleted field but then it may be quite hard to get it back out again. And Eric's initial modelling was suggesting in the order of about what, losses of between 20 and 30% maybe. This could be changed potentially depending on how um, it's managed. But I think that's probably the major source of like losses more than leakage. At the surface, for sure, you have detection technologies to make sure there's no leakage and everything. So um, that to make sure the plant is operated safe. But there could be losses underground. Yeah. And thanks for that, Chris. Um, I have a question here from Ray Bins. Uh, again, thank you for your informative talk. Is there any Australian data on uh, hydrogen associated with serpentinids? And sorry, serpentinite. So my illustrious <laughs> panel here understands that understands the technical elements. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, well, from our database of natural hydrogen in in uh, gases, we don't really have any that are associated with serpentinites as such. A lot of data for overseas and. Uh, some we've done in field studies is that we've gone to serpentinites or ultramafic rocks and measured hydrogen in the soil associated with the serpentinites. And in one of my case studies, we went to the tumid area close to, to Canberra uh, that has major 
occurrences of ultramafix rocks and it's got the tumour, it's the pepnite. And in that region, we saw our highest concentrations of hydrogen in the, in the soil gases. An interesting one to look forward to. Thank you, Chris. Um, now, from this is for you, Andrew, um, and it's from James Knight. Are you able to comment on the feasibility of storing hydrogen in saline aquifers, which ha these have large storage capacity, and if they have an anti-clinical clinical trap? And I've said that wrong, but you will fix that <laughs> up for me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Jamie. Um, yes, there's no reason why you couldn't store in saline aquifers, although for underground hydrogen storage, you're actually looking for quite a small structure, um, ideally, because you want to try and minimise those losses. So if you put the hydrogen in, you push it to the edge, and you pull it out again, there's a little bit left over, and each time you do that, you could get potentially more and more losses. So people are looking for smaller type domal type structures, which you could do that, or fault bound type structures. Um, the other thing is you need really high permeability, again, to sort of minimize those losses. Because if you, unlike say CO2 storage, where you want to push it in and then for it to stay there, with hydrogen, you want to push it in and then pull it back out again. So you need smaller structures and um, high permeability. So if that can be met with a saline aquifer, there's no reason why that couldn't be worked. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, now, this is a double banger for both you and Chris. So maybe Chris might start, and Andrew, if you want to add to it. Um, if hydrogen is being detected in soil gases, does that mean we ha may have an emission up from depth to atmosphere that is not being accounted, or could it be that microbes, etc., in the soil are creating, reprocessing, or removing the hydrogen? Uh, that's a great question, <laughs> and it's one that's probably not completely resolved at this stage. Where the soils are uh, a large sink for hydrogen, so you have an influx of hydrogen, and then you've got the utilization of hydrogen. So when you get seepage, obviously. The microbial community um, can utilise hydrogen that's coming up from deeper. So where you do detect hydrogen in, in the soil, there are other uh, techniques or analyses that can be done looking at the associated gases, the isotopes of the gases, that can give you a, a better understanding of the source and obviously microbes that utilise hydrogen will in, in part a, a signature on the remaining hydrogen. So we, we do have technologies or analytical procedures that can distinguish those. But having said that, yes, if you do get hydrogen in the soil gas, the one other, the main question is that, do, do you, is it a flux? Are you getting renewable? hydrogen coming from deep down. So there's not many flux measurements that have been undertaken uh, around the, the world and in, in Australia. So that's obviously one aspect that we'll be looking forward in the future to, to measure fluxes of, of hydrogen uh, and then account for what's being produced from deep down and that, that what's being consumed by microbes. And microbes can al also produce hydrogen in, in, in the soil. Andrew, he covered it, I but I need to... <laughs> yes, Chris, you've covered that quite fulsome. Yeah. Um, now, Marcus, very excited. We've got a question here for you from Jared Austin. As you mentioned, the renewable build out for green steel for facilities is quite large. Now, do you see this as the primary constraint to growing a green steel production? Yeah, thank you, Jared. Um, uh, it's a very interesting question. Um, yeah, I think uh, it's certainly something that's become apparent, at least to, to my mind, in, in through developing the green steel economic fairways mapper is, is the scale of, of the challenge that's before us. Um, particularly in terms of the volumes of iron ore that Australia currently produces um, and the energy requirements that would be um, needed to, um, to transition that to a, a low carbon um, production model. Um, I guess, you know, there's a number of, of constraints um, that are going to be 
uh, challenges that we need to address. Um, the renewable build is, is certainly one, um, which I guess talks about um, our ability to make decisions around um, land use, mm -hmm. um, the challenge of, of uh, the um, common infrastructure sort of usage type problem that I talked about in the talk. Um, you know, I, th I think I showed in, in, in the graph um, that showed the, the hour by hour sort of energy flow through the system, mm -hmm. um, that for that particular model we're seeing a lot of energy curtailment. So our ability to actually utilise that energy, um, to do that in, um, in ways that allow us to couple it with other industries, um, would certainly help to facilitate this and take a bit of the pressure off um, how much energy we're going to need. Um, I guess part of it is also then the technology costs associated with the different um, renewable systems. Um, we've got forecasts for how that plays out into the future. Uh, and I guess the, our, our tool allows you to, to play with some of those assumptions and see the influence um, of how they would come together, how that favours different parts of the country or otherwise. Um, so yeah, currently that, that's certainly one of the, the main problems and the tool that we've um, produced provides a capability to look at how that actually plays out in informing um, land use decisions and that, that do need to be made um, in terms of being able to decarbonise steel. Yep. Right. Thank you for that, Marcus. This is very exciting. I've got a question for the, all three of you and i um, happy if someone wants to take the lead on this. Um, thank you all for your presentations. It's all been very insightful. Are you able to comment at all on the relative economics of extracting and transporting natural hydrogen to places of use versus manufacturing green hydrogen at the place of use? What a question. Well, Who would like to go first? I'll have a stab. Okay, <laughs> um, over to you. <laughs> yeah, it's a, actually a really great question. I guess the thing we need to keep in mind with natural hydrogen is that um, it's still early days and we don't know whether really commercial quantities of that can be produced. I mean, the work that Gold Hydrogen are doing is fantastic. It's going to give us insight into that, but we're still, you know, at that early stage of when natural hydrogen. So whether it can be produced in commercial rates that can sort of match what you can get from manufactured green hydrogen. Um, in terms of transport costs, actually hydrogen pipelines uh, not as expensive as you might think. Um, I've been speaking with various people about this. It's in the order of, you know, one or two million dollars a kilometre, roughly. Um, so, you know, depending on um, how far away you would need to transport your hydrogen, um, you're looking at that sort of price. Uh, Chris? You know. uh, yes, oh, thanks, Andrew. I agree with all of that. Uh, for economics for natural hydrogen, I think you want large volumes of natural hydrogen, so where would you look for those? So I think you would need something of the order of a reservoir size in sedimentary basins. So, and a lot of sedimentary basins have been uh, explored for, from a petroleum industry point of view, so there is a lot of infrastructure around there. Uh, sources would be different, they could be uh, local within the basin or from the sort of hard rock basement rocks. So, but seeing there's so many sources of natural hydrogen, you probably have a lot of niche areas. Uh, you could, say, produce a, a, a smaller volume of a hydrogen-rich gas, which you could blend with, uh, with natural gas in a pipeline. So you could utilise it uh, directly. So the economics of that would be fairly low. Uh, or you could use it in, uh, you know, we may start finding it in more remote areas. So remote, remote communities which may be um, off grid can use a very hydrogen rich uh, natural gas for energy uh, production there. So the economics would depend on where you find it to a certain extent and the size of the uh, reservoir or, or, or the resource. I think um, one of the things that to me this question points to is a, um, a really important role for pre-competitive geoscience mm -hmm. in this space. I guess like I could, I could make some comments off, off the cuff but with tools like 
we've been developing, we don't necessarily have to just make assumptions. We can actually pose some interesting questions like this and test them. Um, and that's true of you know, the relative um, economics between natural hydrogen and, and green, you know, green hydrogen that's being produced at a facility. It's true of um, the opportunities for salt storage. There's a lot of opportunities to, to do the pre-competitive geoscience, understand how that influences and interacts with um, things like economics and to do some you know, high level um, back of the envelope calculations that can then inform our forward work programs, um, inform what we mm -hmm. understand of the opportunities so that when, um, when I guess resources are, natural hydrogen resources are being identified and numbers are putting on, on those, we can actually look at how viable that is for uh, enhancing these sorts of industries. What a clear demonstration from that question that Max Phyllis, Max Phyllis put forward about the importance of pre-competitive, understanding our, um, what's under our feet for want of a simpler term and how then we can link it into the economics in suiting within and looking within a regional structure and benefits um, to Australia more broadly. Um, that was our last question. Thank you all for your time. I do believe we went a bit over time as well. So thank you all for holding on before having your break or getting your next cup of tea or coffee before we start up again. Um, and I will have to draw this question and answer session to a close. I specifically want to uh, thank our panel that's sitting here with me, Marcus, Chris and Andrew, and also Eric, who, who is over there in the UK. And thank you to everyone who has been, who attended today's session and held on even a bit longer. If you would like to still ask a question or make contact, please email us at eftf at ga.gov.au. And that I want to remind you, the showcase will continue in around about 30 minutes at 12.30. And our next session is going to be on sedimentary basin resource potential, source rocks, carbon capture and storage and groundwater. Now, remember, the link for that, for the next session will work. The link for the next session is the same link that we've used for this session and it will continue to work. If you missed anything from today's session or you would like to re-watch something, the recordings will be available in the coming days on our showcase webpage and that's ga.gov.au forward slash showcase. We look forward to seeing you shortly. Thank you.